Well, I, again, I want to welcome you to 40 Days in the Word. <laughs> this may, I believe this, these six weeks may very well change your life. I really do. I'm not just saying that. The heart of 60 Days in the Word is going to be what we do in our small groups. Uh, in these groups, we're going to be looking at materials that Pastor Rick Warren, designer of the 40 Days, is going to be teaching us by video teaching. And the, the basic subject is how to unlock the Word of God for ourselves, okay? So that you're not dependent on me or anyone else to understand the Word of God. He's going to teach us how to interpret the Word of God, how to feed ourselves from the Word of God. So obviously you want to be in a small group. It's going to be very important. Several aspects of our 40 Days program happen in those small groups. So if you're not in one yet... Do it today. It's not too late. I've already mentioned that. Extra workbooks available. Uh, if you're not sure about what to do, contact me, email me, call me, whatever. I'll be glad to help you with it. <clears throat> then there are daily devotionals. And these are um, video devotionals on the Word of God. Rick Warren kind of hooked up with 40 top Bible teachers. And each day, uh, you're going to get a... Uh, uh, a video devotional that's five to ten minutes long. Most of them I saw are closer to ten minutes, but they're really good, okay? And you're going to start those tomorrow morning, okay? So uh, if we don't have your email or a text for a reminder, by the way, you can always go to the website. There's going to be a link for those. You can always get it there. And we'll be trying to put it on our Facebook group page and everything to try to get as many people involved. Then there's the six weekend messages, which is today's the first one. And um, let me say this. I think you really will benefit from the sermon note handout or outline. It's really not a handout. It's online. You can click on it online. I hope you'll even do that now if you can, because... There's so much to these sermons. There's so much information. If you fill that out, uh, I think you'll want to save this message to use at other times. Uh, let me, uh, one, one highlight of that. Make sure when you get there, you download the file to your computer or phone or whatever before you start filling it in. Uh, because there, it can be the way your phone is set up or the way we put it up there. You could start filling it in. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I looked after the message and I got someone's sermon notes right on the website. Okay, you didn't get them, but I got them. They were pretty good. Okay, <laughs> but you got to download it first. <clears throat> okay, so, and I hope you'll be here all six weeks. So the Bible is the most read book in history. It's the best-selling book in history. It's the most translated book in history. But the question today is, why is it the Word of God? Why is the Bible the Word of God? How do we know that this book is the Word of God? Okay, we're going to look at that as we start. First verse we're going to look at is 2 Timothy 3.16. It says this, it says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, we're going to look at that verse again later on, but I want you to look at the first phrase, all scripture is God-breathed. Circle that word, God-breathed. Okay, that's what we're talking about today. The, that word God-breathed in Greek is theo Neustos. It's kind of a combination word. Theo meaning God, neustos meaning breathe. God breathe. What does that mean? Well, some translations translate that word as inspired. That's a great word. But, you know, we use that word in many ways, so make sure you understand it. We're not talking about it like an inspiring writer or, or even an inst inspiring book, okay? We're talking about that God inspired. This is a God-inspired book. It's a God-breathed book. The Bible, in other words, the Bible is not just a good idea. It's God's word to us. Uh, it, as a result of that, you know, it, it makes a difference in our lives. Uh, and Psalm 119.86 tells us this. It says, all your commands can be trusted. Everything in the Bible can be trusted because it's been breathed out by God, okay? It comes from God. And, and, and that's the point of today. You know, it's one thing for me or anyone else to claim, even for the Bible, to claim that it's the Word of God. But how do we know it? 
and can we know it? How do I really know that the Bible can be trusted, that it's fully the Word of God? Uh, it's not just a bunch of fables, a bunch of stories that are put together by people over the years. Now, to some of you say, well, of course it isn't, but that's really a legitimate question. And it's one that's worth thinking about, okay? Um, we need to ask that up front. How do I know I can trust it? Because you're going you're gonna to really put your, your life's hope on the truths in this word. So this morning, we're going to try to hopefully settle that issue in our minds because there are really many incredible proofs and evidences and facts that you can know that the Bible stands out above every other book as a special book that was put together by God. You know, so you're not making your mind about the Bible based, up on, based on what even what I say or what other people may say, but what the Bible actually claims for itself, what history and science all tell us to, learn, to understand about the Bible. So I'm going kind of quick because I got a lot to cover. I got seven things. I could give you 70 things, but I picked out seven for this, and that's still a lot of parts. So let's see how we do on this. Seven reasons why you can know that the Bible is God-breathed. It's his word to us, his word to us. The first one is this, because the Bible is historically accurate. It's, it's for that reason I know I can trust the Bible. You know, in other words, the Bible isn't just doctrinally correct. The Bible isn't just theologically correct. It's not just uh, accurate regarding morals and ethics. It's true history, and that true history helps us to believe all those other things. Real people, real places, real time frames, the Bible is true historically. Why is that even important? Because the Bible tells us this. It says that God can't lie. Okay, we just talked about that. A lot of people ask, you know, is there anything God can't do? Well, actually, yeah, there's a bunch of things God can't do. Um, God cannot deny himself. God cannot not be God. God cannot lie because God always tells the truth. Okay, in fact, the Bible says this in Hebrews 6.18. It says, it is impossible for God to lie. You know, and um, the, the only reason the universe works the way it does is because God is a God of truth, and which means that that stuff is true all the time. Can you imagine, for, for instance, if the law, laws of, the law of gravity worked only on Tuesdays and Thursdays? <laughs> It'd be pretty weird, right? You know, but the laws of physics are true every day. They're true, you know, whether you want to believe them or not. God thought them up. God created them. God created the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics on which the universe runs. God cannot lie. If this book has lies in it, it's not God's book. Because God cannot lie. Psalm 33, 4 says it like this. It says, the word of the Lord is right and true. It's not only true and right about salvation, it's true and right about history, because it has a lot of history in it. So how do we know that the Bible is historically accurate? Well, you really know the Bible is historically accurate by the same way you know any book is historically accurate. You go by the tests of good history. For instance, one of the ways you test good history is, is it from eyewitness accounts? You know, an historian would say, you know, this, is it written down by someone who actually saw it happen, or is it secondhand or thirdhand? Or is it a legend, a legend written down hundreds of years later? The Bible is primar primarily eyewitness accounts. That's why it's good history. Moses was there when the Red Sea split. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho fell. The disciples of Jesus sat in the upper room and saw the resurrected Jesus appear after he had died. And they wrote down what happened, and we read about it in the Bible. So it's eyewitness accounts of what happened. Another test of history by which we know the Bible is accurate is the extreme care with which the Bible was copied. You may have heard people say, I'm sure the Bible was right when it was first written, but you know, it's been a long time. It's been passed down over many generations, translated into many languages, and all those changes have come in, and we can't trust it anymore. Ever heard that? I have. If you've heard that, you know that whoever said that uh, hasn't taken the time to study it 
or to look into it. Because when you look into it, you find out the extreme care with which the Bible is handed down and copied. Take the Old Testament. The Old Testament copyists, the scribes, they would copy these scrolls from one to another, and it had to be in their mind exact. Okay, they had this long list of rules that they had to go by to make sure it was exact. Here's just a couple of them. To make sure that it was always right, they had this rule that they had to copy from one scroll to another new scroll, letter by letter, not even word by word, letter by letter. And they knew that they knew in a book that they were they knew how many letters were in every book. For example, they knew how many, let's say, A's in English, A's. Uh, they would know that in the book they were recording that the letter A was there 1,653 times, okay? And when they finished uh, copying it, they would count up all the A's, and if it came out the 1,654 times, they'd throw out that manuscript. Had to be accurate, exact. They were so exact, they knew the middle letter of, of the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, it's called, they knew the middle letter of the whole Old Testament, you know. And after they copied all of this, they would go to that middle letter. They'd find it. They knew where it was in the Bible. And then they would count forward and backwards. And if it wasn't the middle letter in their copy, they threw that copy out. There are lots of ways we could see how exact they really were. But one of the ways we can see how exact they were is called the Dead Sea Scrolls. I bet you've heard of that. Okay. Um, What's so significant about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, let me give you the summary. Dead Sea Scrolls are written about 100 years before Jesus, okay? Uh, they have in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, copies of every single book in the Old Testament except one, the book of Esther, okay? When they found these scrolls, uh, up to that point, the earliest manuscripts of the Old Testament that they had were from 900 years after Jesus. So. In one discovery, they, they captured a thousand years back to see and could look at the same books to see how accurate they had been, been copied over those years. So there's a thousand year gap. You, and you want to know how much changed? Well, actually, about 5% changed. It was almost, but almost of that 5%, almost every single percent of that was a spelling of words and spelling of names. The rest was identical. Over a thousand, that's a thousand years. Can you imagine that? They didn't have copy machines, typewriters, or anything. Those copyists were proved right as they copied it again and again and again and again, and they made it right. That's another proof of the historical accuracy of the Bible. Another proof is archaeology. You look at archaeology and it proves again and again that the places, the people that are recorded in the Bible, that they're not fiction, they're fact. You can go find those places today. We've dug up many of those places. The Are Areopagus where Paul was, the theater in Athens where it was, there was that riot in the book of Acts, We've, they've dug them up. They know where they are. You can see them today. The pool of Siloam where the blind man was healed. The portion, portions of Herod's temple have all been dug up. You know, they were all real. We can see them. I mean, the book of Acts is all about historical accuracy. Luke was a historian as well as a doctor, and he talks about 54 different cities in that book, 39 countries and nine different islands, all of them with complete historical accuracy. One of the great things about how archaeology works with the Bible is, is how again and again it's shown that actually the Bible is more accurate than our ideas of history. There have been many times where we've had an idea of what was historical, and, uh, and, they, and so people would say, well, the Bible's wrong. Scholars would say, well, that's, that's not, the Bible can't be right because we don't find that, you know, in reality. But the Bible constantly proves itself to be right. For instance, for a long time, historians said that we're not sure that Solomon, King Solomon, even lived. They had no records of him. You know, and they were certainly sure that when the Bible said that King Solomon had these stables of horses, that that, that, that wasn't true because they only had they only used camels back then. So that can't be right. Until they just 
archaeologists dug up Medigo and they discovered one of Solomon's chariot cities. So they discovered Solomon was real and it was a, a it had thousands of stables for guess what? Horses. So the Bible proved right. One of the great examples is that of the uh, empire called the Hittites. There's a whole empire in, that are mentioned in, in the Old Testament called the Hittites that were not talked about anywhere else. So scholars for years thought, well, the Hittites, that's, that's an imaginary empire. You know, we have uh, uh, Mormon neighbors that uh, have a history of America that includes all these cities and, and uh, civilizations that actually nothing has ever been proved any, not even one point of that has been proved that it even existed. But here was a, an empire called the Hittites, and they said, well, there's one in the Bible, doesn't exist, the Hittites. So for centuries, historians said the Bible had just made that up until in the early 1900s, a professor by the name of Hugo Winkler discovered 10,000 clay tablets at the capital of the Hittite empire. Now everyone believes in the Hittites. In fact, you can go on Wikipedia. You can do that today, later on, and read about the Hittites if you want. You know, so the Bible is historically accurate. Let's go to the second one. The Bible is scientifically accurate. This is a big one. But I'll try not to spend too much time. But we'll go quicker as we go. Not only is the Bible historically accurate, it's scientifically accurate. There's so much misunderstanding about that in our world today. You know, essentially people who think, they think that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. It, basically, it means, I think, two things. A, it means they've never really studied the Bible. And B, they probably don't know about science either. Because the truth is, God set up the laws of science and he made sure that his word didn't contradict with the other laws that he created. You know, God created all laws of the world. Uh, God, God was not, the, now the Bible wasn't meant to be a scientific book, right? Obviously, you don't study the Bible to build a rocket or something like that. And the Bible doesn't use scientific language. Okay, but the Bible never, ever, ever gives bad science. Okay, uh, never, not once in over 1,600 years over the period that the Bible was written does it give bad science. In fact, it, it's always in some ways ahead of science. There are things in the Bible that the Bible told us that were true that were just discovered like 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Jonas Kepler, the famous mathematician and astronomer, said this, he was a Christian, he said, science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. In other words, God established the laws of physics and we discover them. God establishes the laws of biology and we discover them. God establishes the laws of mathematics and we discover them. They're God's laws. I'm not anti-science at all. Science is a way, science is a great way to discover God's truth about things. Okay, one thing about truth, it never changes. One thing about science, it constantly changes. Because science is the process of discovering truth, and it doesn't always get there at once. There's nothing more worthless than an obsolete science book, right? I guarantee you, except for those of you that are in sixth grade or seventh or eighth grade, the science book that you had in sixth grade is not being used in sixth grade today, right? Uh, a lot of things in that book are no longer believed or even, th even taught. You can find them in, in any garage sale. You know, nobody wants them because they're so out of date. If you had been reading the Bible 1,500 years ago or, or 700 years ago or 500 years ago, what the Bible says would not have matched much of what science of that day said. Why? Well, for one thing, because the science was wrong. And that raises an interesting point. One of the proofs that we know that this book is simply not a man-made book is that we know it, and we know it's the Word of God, is what's not in it. What's not in it? What do you mean by that? Because, you see, if this were a human book, 
you would expect to find it filled with scientific facts of the prevailing day when, when it was written. But they're not there. They're not in this book. For instance, for thousands of years, for thousands of years, the people on earth thought the world was flat, right? Uh, it wasn't until Copernicus and Galileo and Columbus realized that the world was not flat. It's, it's a sphere. It's round. It's, it's a ball. So you would expect the Bible that was written in those days to say that the earth was flat because it was in existence uh, and being written during those thousands of years when everyone in the world thought the world was flat. There's not a single verse in the Bible that says the earth is flat. Not at all. In fact, it says just the opposite. 2,600 years ago, God said in the book of Isaiah 40, in verse 22, God is enthroned above the sphere of the earth. 2,600 years ago, the Bible said the earth was round. The earth is a sphere. The earth is a globe. But, you know, when that was written, nobody believed that. Why is it in there? Because God wrote the Bible through people. God said it because it was true whether anyone believed it or not. For thousands of years, people believed the earth had to be held up by something. You know, depending on the culture you were in, you got different beliefs on what held the Bible, what held the earth up. It had to be held up by something, they thought. For instance, if you were Greek, in Greek culture, it was taught that Atlas, a giant named Atlas, held the earth. We've all seen pictures of Atlas, right? We know who Atlas is. Well, think about this. Part of the Bible was written in Greek, and it was written during that time when the Greeks believed that. This was the belief. But Atlas is not in the Bible. Why? Because it's not true. So it's not in the Bible. You'd expect that during that time, it would have somehow found its way into the Bible, especially if it was written by people, but it wasn't. For thousands of years, the Hindus believed that the earth sat on the back of giant elephants. That's how it was held up. And, and that when the elephants moved, that caused the earthquakes. What did the elephants stand on? Well, they believed that the giant elephant stood on the back of a giant sea turtle. Now, I'm not making this up. <laughs> you can find this in any encyclopedia. Okay, here's the point. That was the prevailing attitude in the world for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's not in the Bible, though. Even though the Bible, part of the Bible was written during that time. Why? Well, we know why, because it's not true. The Bible says, in fact, in Job 26, it says, he stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on what? Nothing, on nothing. Uh, that's Job 26, 7. I don't think it's on the screen because I didn't put it there, but that's an extra. Now let's take the Egyptians. The Egyptians were flat out brilliant people. We know that, right? They built the pyramids. They were masters at architecture, at engineering, at astronomy. Now the Bible tells us that Moses, Moses was skilled and schooled in all of the best teaching of, uh, of Egypt, of the ancient Egyptians. So so, you know, he was taught what the prevailing science of the day taught. But the ancient Egyptians were dead wrong about what held the earth up, just like the other cultures we talked about. They believed the earth was held up by five pillars. Certainly Moses was schooled in that science, yet not once in Scripture, and Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the human author, not once in Scripture do you find that the earth is held up by five pillars. Why? Because it's not true. So it didn't make it into the Bible. The prevailing science of the day didn't make it there. I'm reinforcing this um, because it's really, it, it, it's illogical and nonsense to say that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. That means you just don't know the Bible. There's so many examples I could give, and there's more than that even, but we don't have the time. But here's one I thought I'd give, one more, because I think we can all identify with this one right now. You know, during the Middle Ages, there was another plague, another pandemic. It's called the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague. Okay, now I'm not trying to minimize the horrible effects of the one that we're in, uh, our pandemic. 
you know, where over 400,000 Americans have died from it. Some of them are people, are relatives and friends. And, uh, and that's, that's nothing to laugh at. But the Black Plague was so much worse. One out of every three people in Europe died. Just, you know, if we did a count, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one out of three of us would have died in, the, in these uh, four or five years of the bubonic plague in Europe, spread across Europe and Asia and, and, and that whole area. Why, why did so many die? Well, for one reason, it's because at that point, they had no understanding of germs, okay? They didn't understand infection, okay? The, the science hadn't gotten there yet, and they didn't understand anything about quarantining people so that they had sick people that had the bubonic plague who were contagious sleeping right next to healthy people. And then more and more people just kept dying off because they didn't know about contagion. They didn't know about germs. So it became an epidemic. It became a pandemic. And one out of three people in Europe died. Terrible. They should have read the Bible. Because thousands and thousands of years before the bubonic plague, God said in Leviticus 13.4, he said, put an infected person in quarantine for seven days. Whoa. God said that. No one knew why, but why did God say that? That's thousands of years before anyone ever knew what germs were, uh, viruses were. That's God saying, Here's how you can take care of people who get infected with an illness, okay? So you're not going to learn this. Your scientists aren't going to learn this for thousands of years, but here's what you do. You quarantine them off. You separate them. And actually, the next verse says that if after seven days they don't look good, give them another seven days, which equals 14 days. Where did I hear that lately? Okay, quarantine for 14 days. <laughs> Nobody understood quarantine because nobody understood germs, but God was right. I could go on and on. The Bible is always scientifically accurate. It's ahead of science, if anything. The Bible says in Proverbs 35, he says, every word of God is flawless. Isn't that great? My, my words aren't flawless. I know I've made a bunch of mistakes already. Yours aren't. Human beings aren't. But every word of God is flawless. We know we can trust the Bible because it's historically accurate, it's scientifically accurate, and let's go on. We know we can trust the Bible because it's prophetically accurate. What does that mean? It means that the predictions that are found in the Bible always come true. The Bible's filled with literally thousands and thousands of prophecies where God says, this is going to happen at such and such a time, in such and such a way, and over all the centuries of these prophecies, they've, all, they've been fulfilled, every single one of them, exactly as God has said, and some of them yet have not yet been fulfilled because they're still in our future. There's over 300 prophecies in the Bible about Jesus the Messiah, okay, that were given over, up to 1,000 years before Jesus was born. 300 prophecies. Things like, this is when he'll be born, this is where he'll be born, this is how he'll be born. You can't control those kind of things if you're trying to make yourself uh, the, the, the Messiah by trying to fulfill prophecies. You have no control over those things. But they're in the Bible. What are the odds of me making 300 predictions about you and every single one of those predictions come true? So astronomical that you... you you wouldn't even know the number to write down. It takes more faith to believe that it was all just a coincidence than to believe that God planned it. It takes enormous faith to believe it's all just random, that there's no designer, there's no creator, that this was just written by human beings. A thousand years before Jesus came and died on the cross, David, in one of his Psalms, Psalm 22, you go read it later, describes what death by crucifixion was like. He didn't use the word crucifixion because no, he, nobody even knew the word back then. This is a thousand years before. But a thousand years before the Romans were even thinking of crucifixion, David describes in, in quite detail what the death from crucifixion would be like. How did he know that? 
Only God could have told him. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.21, no prophecy ever originated from humans. Instead, it was given by the Holy Spirit as God spoke under, as, as spoke under God's direction. You know, the Bible is 100% prophetically accurate. John, Revelation 22.6, John said, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy. In other words, you can trust them. And they're true. Why? Because they're from God. The Lord sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. It's prophetically accurate. Against all odds, these prophecies happening just the way they did over the thousands of years, it's astronomical, the probability. Let's go to the fourth one. The fourth reason that I, I know and I think you can know that the Bible is trustworthy is it is thematically unified. The, what do I mean by that? The entire book, this book from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, has the same theme, the theme of redemption. Jesus is the main character. He's the star from beginning to end. It's, the, it's a thematically unified book. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? I read a lot of books that carry the same theme from beginning to end. But is the book you're reading, you're reading written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors? I don't think so. The Bible is a collection. It's not just one book. It's a collection of 66 books written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors who lived on three different continents, and they didn't even know each other, okay? How do you think they all got the same story? You know, the Old Testament wasn't even collected into one book uh, until 1,000 years after they had all died. How do you think they knew that? The book was written by poets and prophets, princes, kings, sailors, and soldiers. It was written by attorneys and doctors. It was written by prisoners, by common people. All kinds of people, human people, wrote the Bible, but God wrote it through them. You couldn't get a more diverse group of people, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars, businessmen, all over a period of almost 2,000 years. And they all came up with the same theme. you got to be kidding me. Let me give you an example of this. Um, if I had 50 sheets of paper, and, um, and I were to hand each one of you here a piece of paper, just 50, I mean, there's 66 books, but let's just do 50. You know, and I said, okay, you got this little sheet of paper. I want you to tear it up and uh, rip it up into a shape, and I don't care what kind of shape it is. You decide. I'm not going to tell you why I want you to tear it that way. I'm not going to give you any facts or details. You just pick a shape and tear it and then hand it back in. Okay. Um, what would be the odds that all 50 or that the 50 pieces of paper would come together to form a perfect map of the United States of America? Perfect. <laughs> You wouldn't believe it if it did, would you? You'd say, that's a trick, and it would be, of course. The odds are too astronomical to, to just accept that they all would just unify together and fit together perfectly. But the Bible, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is even more than that. It has many places, many people, many centuries, and yet it all fits together in one unified theme. Jesus said in Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Did you get that? Most people think the New Testament is about Jesus and the Old Testament is about Israel. That's wrong. Jesus said the New Testament... Well, in fact, the New Testament wasn't even written yet when Jesus said that. He's talking about the Old Testament. This story, this story from beginning to end is about Jesus. Jesus redeeming the world. Jesus redeeming you and I back to God. The pictures, the metaphors, the analogies, the illustrations, everything in Scripture from beginning to the end is about God's plan to redeem people and build a family for eternity. It all began with him. 
The star of the story is Jesus. And you can see him in every book of the Bible. We're going to be seeing some of that in our 40 days small group study. Let me go to the fifth one. The fifth reason why I can trust the Bible is because, well, it's, it's been confirmed by Jesus. Jesus trusted the Bible. You may have already, maybe you have heard someone say, maybe you've even thought this some, yourself, well, I, I can trust what Jesus said. I'm just not so sure about those other guys. You know, here's the challenge to that. Jesus trusted those other guys. He trusted the whole Bible. So if I trust Jesus, then I have to trust the rest of the Bible because Jesus trusted the rest of the Bible. That's simple, right? Um, Jesus said this book was a unique book. It was God's book. Matthew 5.18, here's what he said. He said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus looks at the Bible and he says it's going to last until the end of time. It's going to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. Jesus proclaimed the truth of the Bible. Why wouldn't I trust it if Jesus trusted it? You know, it sort of makes me smile when two or 3,000 years later, uh, we look back on the Bible and go, well, I'm going to trust that part but I'm not going to trust that part. You know, based on my feelings, my subjective experience, I'm going to accept this, but I'm not going to accept that. You know, but Jesus trusted it. Jesus trusted it, so we need to trust it. St. Augustine said many years ago, he said, if you believe in the Bible what you like and don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible you trust, it's yourself. I don't know about you, but I found that my emotions and my opinions are not always trustworthy. So I'm going to trust Jesus. That's one of the main reasons why I trust the Bible. Here's another one. Sixth reason you can trust the Bible as the absolute authoritative word of God is this. It has survived all attacks. I mean, that makes it an unusual book. The Bible is in some ways the most despised book, the most denied book, the most disputed, the most dissected, the most debated book, the most outlawed and banned book on the planet. You know, uh, it is, um, it is uh, attacked by university professors and other religions. Millions of people have died because they've refused to give up their Bibles. People, it, it's illegal to own a Bible in some countries. It's still illegal in some countries. Today, if you take a Bible into North Korea or Iran, uh, you're risking your life. You can get killed for it. You can get thrown in jail for it. The Bible has been under attack century after century by every kind of thing we can imagine, and yet, yet it's still the most read book in the world. It's the most published book. It's the best-selling book in the world, and it's still making a difference in people's lives. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, 35. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The only thing on this planet that's going to last is the Word of God. It's eternal. Everything else is going to burn up someday, but the Word of God is eternal, and its, it's truth will last forever. Voltaire was a famous famous French philosopher. He was a brilliant man, Voltaire. He was, he, was a, a, he was an atheist, but he was flat out brilliant. He wrote a number of tracts that derided the Bible. He made a very famous statement which said this, and I quote, 100 years from today, the Bible will be a forgotten book. Everybody's forgotten that quote. And after Voltaire died, for nearly a hundred years, his homestead was used as a book depository by the French Bible Society. Boy, that's irony, huh? And, and they sold Bibles out of his house for a hundred years. It's now a museum, but they did. People have forgotten Voltaire. Nobody forgets the Bible. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said. My word will never pass away. Remember, truth will always be truth. Whether I believe it's truth or not, I could say I believe the moon is made out of cheese. But we know that it's proven that the moon is made out of rock. Our astronauts brought some of it back. You know, uh, 
no matter how much I say, I believe the moon is made out of cheese, that doesn't change the reality. It's made out of rock. In fact, there's a lot of things that are true that I wish they weren't true. You know, so I, so I could say, I don't believe it. I don't want it to be true. That doesn't make it untrue. I don't want that to be immoral. It doesn't matter whether I want it to be immoral or not. God, what God says is moral is moral. And what God says is not moral, it's not moral. It's not my choice. He's God, we're not. If I were to say to you, I don't believe in the law of gravity, that's fine. If you want to believe in the law of gravity, go ahead. But I don't believe in the law of gravity. So you and I go up to the top of the Empire State Building and I say, well, I don't believe in that law of gravity. I don't think it applies to me because I don't believe in it. So I jump off the Empire State Building and I'm floating down at quite a high rate of speed, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'm about 50 floors down and, you know, I'm doing okay. Not bad. 50 floors down. But you know what? I'm going to hit the bottom. And that's the, way, that's the way a lot of people are living their lives. You can run from God for the rest of your life, but, but you can't, at some point, you can't run anymore. Okay, the truth is at some point, your face is going to hit the ground. Okay, you're going to come face to face with God one day, whether you believe in him or not. And all of the, I don't believe in him, or I don't believe that's wrong, isn't going to stop those events from happening. The reality is you don't break God's laws. They, they break you. When I ignore what God says is inspired and infallible and inerrant, when I ignore what he says, or I say, I don't like that part, I only hurt myself. I don't hurt God, I hurt myself. Let's go to the seventh one, because we've got to finish. The seventh one is, in a sense, maybe the most subjective one, so it needs to be seventh, but it, in some ways it's the dearest one to me and probably to you. I, I believe the Bible is true because it has transforming power. Transforming power. Nothing can change lives of people like the Word of God. Your life, my life has been changed by the Word of God, I hope. Millions and millions and millions of lives have been changed through the truths of the Word of God. I've seen flat-out drunks and irresponsible addicts get their life cleaned up and sober because they started to read the Bible and take its truths seriously. I've seen the most self-centered, narcissistic, it's all about me type of person who thinks only of themselves and would rip anyone off simply to make themselves feel better. Read the Bible have their lives transformed and become godly people, godly husbands, godly wives, dads, upstanding citizens. See, if I thought that you could change human behavior by laws, I would become a politician. I have zero faith in politics to actually change the greatest problems on this planet because you can make all the laws in the world, but that isn't going to change a person's heart, right? You can make a law that outlaws racism and bigotry, but no law is going to turn a bigot into a lover. God's got to do that. God's got to change our hearts. And I've seen it happen time after time after time because of this book and its truths. It changes people you would never imagine it could change. Jesus said it like this, John 8, 31 says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I want you to be free. You know what's the most amazing thing about that passage? I was thinking about it. Secular universities and libraries all around the world have the second half of that verse printed in stone over the arches of the buildings all over the place. The truth will make you free. But they ignore the first part, right? They ignore the first part. What does it say? If you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Not just if you go out and make up your own opinion and write it down, or if you discover a law of physics and write, it, write an article about it, and that will set you free. No. 
If you continue in my word, the truth will make you free. So let's conclude. That's why we're spending six weeks, 40 days in the word together to get closer to the truth of God and closer to God himself. The fundamental question, the most important question that you're going to ask yourself in life is this. What is going to be the final authority for my life? You need to decide that, and I recommend you decide it today. Is it going to be the Word, God's Word, or is it going to be the world? Am I going to listen to what God says is true, or am I going to listen to public opinion or my own set of feelings and thoughts? Who's going to be the authority in my life, your life, God or me? God's plan for your life is good. God's plan is pleasing, and God's plan for your life is perfect. But you only are going to know that and know that perfect plan through the perfect Word of God. I want you to settle that today, to accept the Bible as the flawless word, the final authority of your life. I'd like you to pray this prayer with me right now. Would you do that, every one of us? Let's just talk to God about this. Pray this with me. Say it in your mind. Say, dear God, from this day forward, I will accept the Bible as your flawless word to me. I will make it the final authority for my life. Not what television says, not what popularity says, not what I feel like doing or what I think sounds good. I'm going to make the Bible the final authority in my life. Thank you, God, for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. Thank you that you're not silent. Thank you that you spoke through about 40 people over 1,600 years from three continents and three languages to tell me one story, that you wanted me in your family and that you want me to know you and that you made me for a purpose. Thank you that you're not silent. I want to love your word. I want to learn your word. I want to live your word. Use 40 days in my life to set me on the right path. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I just want to say one quick word to those who may be listening or here today who, who, who have not come to personally uh, know Jesus Christ and his redeeming work for your life. You know, if you've never put your life into the hands of the loving God who created all of this so you can find him, so you can... Put your life into the hands of Jesus as your Savior, your Lord. Why don't you do that today? This word, you could trust it. And this word makes that clear. It's completely different from every other book of religion. It's the only one that shows in many ways that it's supernaturally been given to us. And we've been talking about today. Given to us so we can know that God loves us and is seeking to make a relationship with you that will last forever. Won't you, won't you start that today? Let your sins be forgiven. Enter into his family. You can do that today. And I'm just going to lead us in a very short prayer once again. You know, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. We can be forgiven. Only he can do that. That's why this book is so important. Only Jesus can do it. So God sent a book to make sure we know. And what you need to do is receive his gift. You can do it in prayer if you'll pray with me right now. It's a simple prayer. Let me pray it. You pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to begin a relationship with you. Thank you for paying for my sin at the cross. Now I turn from my sin and turn and put my faith in you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help me to know you and live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning and meant it, God heard it. And he'll begin working in your life, making you his child. And we're going to be dismissed at this point.